a very, very hearty welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us in this uh, CREED webinar on um, COVID-19 and religious inclusivity. What will it look like a year from now? Um, as mentioned in the briefing we sent and the two uh, articles, um, COVID-19 is no great equalizer. And we know that impacts on social exclusion, on social cohesion, on um, vi even violence and conflict um, can be quite acute, but also providing us with opportunities for social solidarity, for uh, rethinking um, our policy and practice. We are so delighted today to have with us Mr. Rahman Shishti, um, the Prime Minister's Special Envoy for Freedom of Religion or Belief. Um, we are very delighted to also welcome, uh, joining us virtually as with everyone, um, Mr. Saeed Ali Abbas from Pakistan, from Hive, um, Hajja Fatma Sulaiman from the Islamic Council Initiative of Nigeria, and Mr. Uh, Salam Omar uh, from Iraq, from the Editor-in-Chief of uh, Kirkuk Now and Mr. Mike Badcock, uh, the civil society team leader uh, for Inclusive Societies Department at the Department of International Development. Um, and also, I just want to say just a very a, a, a few quick notes. Um, you, uh, we, will, we will have the presentations for the first hour, then we will have half an hour uh, for uh, Q&A. Um, we have sent two articles to everyone, two fake news articles, where we sought to share uh, what, it, what uh, uh, COVID-19 inclusive policy may look like in 2021 and another fake news article that looks like what will happen if we don't engage with the implications uh, of this now for a year's time or for the future. Uh, one, two, my, my name is Marie Stadros. I am from the Institute of Development Studies. And on behalf of the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development, I uh, want to again well, give you a warm welcome. The Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development is a consortium, a collaboration between El Hoi Foundation, the Coptic Office for Advocacy and Public Policy, Minority uh, Rights uh, Group, um, and uh, it, uh, it looks at how do we make uh, policy inclusive for the economically uh, marginalized uh, groups um, with respect to their freedom of religion or belief rights. Um, we have sent the bios to everyone, so you will have more detailed um, description of Mr. Shishti's work and what he's done and for all the participants and all the speakers. Um, and you would have also received uh, the articles, which we will come back to. And um, I think for now, without much ado, Mr. Shishti, uh, thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours. Bruce, can I first of all say uh, thank you so very much um, for all the work that the Coalition for Religious Equality and Inclusive Development does. To you and your team, um, thank you for uh, the fantastic work you do in research because governments around the world, they need research to develop you know, the right policies uh, to implement Article 18 so that individuals around the world can practice their faith or no faith. And the work that you do, um, Creed, is absolutely crucial uh, with regards to that. And I know um, our government supported the work of Creed in 2018 when we provided around £12 million for the research work that is being done uh, by, by Creed. So your team and all the other stakeholders and I have to say, in my work, I get to meet some amazing people. And I know when you and your team came with stakeholders to brief me on the work that you have been doing um, across the board on development, on uh, addressing the issues of uh, you know, hate speech, on interfaith, uh, it was absolutely invaluable to me in the work that I do. So thank you to you. And also um, a real pleasure to have all the participants that are um, um, with us today and if people haven't when Maurice and the team came to see me they gave me a document inclusive development beyond need or creed and I would recommend that read to to anyone a very very good document highlighting some of that great work um, can I just say with regards to the, um, the the title of the debate that we have today you know how can we address religious inequalities in post-covid-19 transition that is the topic that we have today but then when we look at that, we have to look at 
the challenges that people of faith and no faith had prior to this across the board. So with COVID-19 has exacerbated some of those real challenges that individuals of faith or no faith have had uh, across the board around different parts of the world. And that's why making sure our policy, our research, our developmental work, you know, goes hand in hand is absolutely crucial. And with regards to COVID-19 and some of the challenges faced by, faced by religious minorities, you know, I, I get to see and hear from parliamentarians, from NGOs, uh, from faith leaders, and this is what they said to me. They said to me in a recent correspondence that with regards to COVID-19 and four, at least five specific COVID-19 related trends are emerging. Firstly, some governments are using the pandemic to further repress religious minorities. Second, Authorities are often being discriminated against in the provision of food aid and health care. Thirdly, some religious minorities are being blamed for the spread of COVID-19. And fourthly, online propaganda campaigns are targeting religious minorities, spreading misinformation and inciting violence. And that touches on some of the fantastic work that uh, Maurice, you and the team and all the other stakeholders are doing uh, with regards to, I think you mentioned the exercise that you will do later on about misinformation. How do we address hate content online? How do we make sure that, you know, if it, the, the content is removed quickly, swiftly uh, by the different, uh, you know, um, uh, bodies which host it in the first place? Fifthly, technology being misused to further repress, discriminate or surveillance of religious minorities. Those, I thought, is in context to say the title that we have is with regards to how can we address the religious inequalities in post-COVID-19 transition, but also then to give you uh, some of the different specific points raised with me by parliamentarians on specific challenges faced by religious minorities uh, in, uh, in COVID-19. For me, putting that at the top is, as a Prime Minister's Special Envoy, uh, is to do everything that I possibly can um, with counterparts around the world uh, to ensure that individuals are able to practice their basic fundamental rights. And as the Prime Minister's Special Envoy, the work we do bilaterally is absolutely immense. But the work that we can do through multilateral fora, through the Human Rights Council, through the UN, um, and, and now the United Kingdom has joined the International Religious Freedom Alliance, you know, with, uh, with around 29 uh, countries on board, and around eight different observer countries. And for us, over the last three months, um, has been two specific points on uh, addressing on four. COVID-19, working in partnership, hearing uh, evidence from the UN Rapporteur for uh, four, Ahmed Shahid, um, and it's been uh, working with like-minded partners for the release of religious prisoners um, of conscience around the world. So one of the statements that we uh, have given uh, to, uh, yesterday was regards to the uh, the release of the Baha'is in Yemen. So, for the to working through the international multilateral fora, we've been pushing on specifically in the last uh, uh, three months. Uh, COVID nineteen. What can we do bilaterally and multilaterally, internationally, um, for release of religious prisoners of conscience, and also with regards to the um, the issue uh, of COVID nineteen. Uh, specific related issues. One of those comes into what CRE does. Um, recently, the Minister for Human Rights, Dr. Ahmed, and I uh, met with uh, representatives of faith and NGOs, and they raised the point, is how do we best get aid, development aid, to um, faith-related organizations on the ground? I know we had a Walter Park conference uh, in 2018 on humanitarian aid and how we support faith-based organizations. But the current pandemic has pushed that to the fore to say, how do we best address uh, the issue of developmental aid going to faith-based organizations? And often individuals' faith we see um, is a marker of, uh, uh, as it's an identity marker for vulnerability in accessing certain of those basic whether economic rights or developmental uh, uh, aid that they need. How do we best address uh, those specific uh, different uh, challenges. So that's the work we've been doing through the uh, 
uh, to multilateral for fora with the uh, International Religious uh, Freedom Alliance. Can I also say that for me, um, leading on four for the Prime Minister means delivering on the, uh, the Truro Report. The Truro Report which was commissioned by the former Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt um, and accepted by the current Prime Minister Boris Johnson has 22 different recommendations and with regards to uh, the developmental world, there's about four of those recommendations of 22 which touch on research, uh, developmental aid and humanitarian assistance uh, and that very much ties in uh, to uh, where we need to go further with regards to COVID-19 ensuring individuals get the support they, they need. For us at the moment, we have um, 11 of those 22 different recommendations you know, I've taken forward. They're either fully complete or in the progress of being complete. And that, looking at the diverse uh, participants that we have uh, uh, joining us today, um, a number of those recommendations, I think recommendation 11, develop a tailored response to four violations at post level, including advocacy for religious protection, promotion of high quality education for all, including minorities. That work then, when you look at putting that recommendation to practice, of course, you look at the uh, data available from NGOs across the board, and that means countries across the board. Where can the United Kingdom make the most impact? Where is that the greatest infringement of fall? And therefore, take the, and you look at that and work with an advisory board of, you know, which has specific expertise in being able to uh, deliver or, or on those. So the recent announcement we'll probably get to see from the government in the next uh, uh, short period is recommendation eight. Bishop Truro, um, in his report, said we, should, we, the United Kingdom, should be prepared to impose sanctions against perpetrators of fraud abuses. The Foreign Secretary at the moment is in the process of uh, taking that uh, uh, legislation, which we call the Magnitsky style sanctions uh, regime, forward through Parliament. And that will then look at um, specific designations on human rights abuses. Uh, I cannot comment on what those designations are, but the government has accepted the, the recommendation. So the point I make is individuals who violate human rights, there needs to be then accountability. And the government at the moment is looking through the, uh, taking forward the, uh, the, uh, the human rights and Magnitsky style sanctions program. I know I've got short time there is, because I know you are very punctual, but I just wanted to put this other, uh, the, uh, the research work for us is absolutely crucial. So one of the key things which uh, the Bishop of Truro said is we should have a, John Bunyan Thumb looking at research um, supporting the um, uh, four and minorities or belief uh, communities around the world. Um, and for us, um, we, the John Bunyan Fund had 15 different projects which had funding allocated to them. And if you haven't seen it yet, the humanists published their report yesterday with regards to how members of the humanist community are being persecuted. And some issues they faced during COVID-19 will be similar issues that will be faced by other faith organizations around the world. So that report, which we supported, got published yesterday with regards to challenges that they're facing prior to COVID and during COVID-19. And the, the, the wider work um, on the Truro report, uh, I, you know, with regards to early warning signs on atrocity crimes, um, is recommendation seven. And that you know, you work with like-minded international partners to see how can we best get the mechanics in place to help address that. So giving you a snapshot of some of the work which I've been doing, uh, looking at uh, the uh, points which have been raised with me by parliamentarians in COVID-19 and uh, the religious minority around the world, take into account developmental research. I think, uh, Maurice, if I can say this, um, the, the work that you do um, ties into what I take forward for the government, and that is recommendation five, of the Truro Report, which has lost the research into the critical intersection of four and minority rights with the wider human rights issues and other SEO concerns. Security, economic activity, recognizing that religious identity may be a key marker of vulnerability. I just wanted to put that down. Recommendation five of the Truro Report and the work that Creed um, uh, does with all its other key partners is absolutely crucial. And for us, the United Kingdom, four for all is absolutely at the heart of our global outlook. And so thank you so very much for giving me the chance to share some of the work that um, we are doing and the work that we're doing um, with our partners across the board, but also to say um, United Kingdom will always 
uh, stand up for individuals who are being persecuted for their faith or, or no faith uh, and, or, or, or belief. And the work that we look at um, on, promo on, on promoting that uh, is it comes through many different uh, ways and that includes through our developmental work, through work with regards to tackling inequalities, through economic ec activities and also with the, the other point which we'll look at today is how do we address the issue of hate content and social media companies, what can they do to help address this challenge that we have. So thank you very much again for having me. Thank you so much, Mr. Shishi. This was so incredibly um, wide ranging. And I think this is, uh, you, you've left us in a really good place to talk about the so what question. What kind of policies do you want to see on the ground? Um, just to tell everyone that our um, webinar is being recorded. So if you want to be able to listen to Mr. Shishi's um, uh, uh, presentation talk, uh, it will be available on our, on our website. And um, I just want to very briefly before uh, we uh, pass on, um, um, the floor to uh, Said Ali, just want to make a very, very quick um, point about um, the fact that unfortunately history repeats itself in ways that are quite distressing. And the key message is that this is not a, a, an issue exclusively about the members of a religious community. This is about inter interdependence. What will happen if we look the other way? And for that, I want to go back to 2009 when we had the H1 um, N1 um, pandemic, uh, which uh, some estimates say took the lives of more than half a million people. And in that pandemic in 2009, in the context of Egypt, for example, um, where unfortunately it was called the swine flu, people associated it with pigs, um, the Egyptian government decided that it will cull 300,000 pigs. These pigs were being managed by a group that are economically vulnerable, socially vulnerable and religiously vulnerable. They belong to the Coptic Orthodox minority. They had suffered for many centuries pre-existing inequalities. In other words, the H1N1 did not create these inequalities. They were already living um, in a context of economic, social and religious exclusion. Nobody wanted to associate with them because they were garbage collectors and they were associated with dirt and filth. And they had used those pigs in order to create uh, for, many, for many decades a, a very environmentally friendly system of having the pigs eat the garbage, the organic garbage, and therefore keep the country clean. In 2009, when their livelihoods were taken away from them and everyone looked away, um, they had nowhere to go, they had nothing to do. Um, and we are talking here about a large number. We were talking about in thousands, 60, 70,000 uh, members of the garbage collecting community who were predominantly Christian. Um, at that time when I was doing research with them and they said, we have nothing to do with this epidemic. And, and, and it was true. There was no connection between H1 and N1. But the interesting thing is that we saw what we're seeing now was what we saw with them. First, the narrative at that time was the garbage collectors are our ticking bomb. We see the narrative of religious and ethnic minorities being referred to as the ticking bomb in many of the countries we see globally, um, whether it's India, whether it's parts of uh, Europe where we have the Roma community and beyond. So that's the first thing is the term ticking bomb is now being, as was used then, is also we see in our research on religious minorities. The second thing is, as you had mentioned, Mr. Shishti, the kind of idea of cracking down on religious minorities at a time of massive hysteria. So again, um, we saw a context in which um, uh, the garbage collectors, people were saying, we are a Muslim country, there are pits, pigs amongst us, why should we have pigs in a, a Muslim majority context? The same kind of discourse we see towards religious minorities in many um, contexts globally, where they're saying, why do we have these people amongst us? Why do we have the Hazara Shias amongst us in Pakistan? Um, they are bringing the virus from Iran into our context. So the idea again of vilification, of stigmatization, um, we saw in 2009 against the, the garbage collectors and we see in many contexts around the world. Now, in 2009, when I was doing interviews with the garbage collectors, I said to them, I'm so sorry for what is happening to you. I'm so sorry for this mass hysteria. I'm so sorry that everybody's rejecting you. 
And they said, you know what? We will stop collecting the country's garbage. Now, let me tell you, Cairo was never Copenhagen when it came to garbage. You know, before 2009 and, you know, many decades before, we cannot say that Cairo was squeaky clean, even at the time when the garbage collectors were collecting the garbage. But certainly, um, it, wa it, it, it was manageable. Post-2009, and to this day, we're talking here about 2020, we see in the cities, in the villages, in the residential parts of uh, Egypt, we have a major garbage problem. Um, what it was almost like a curse, what they said about, you know, we will let people rot in their garbage has unfortunately come to be true. People, we are seeing parts of Egypt where because they remove the environmentally sustainable uh, system that the garbage collectors had managed via the pigs consuming the garbage, we see a major garbage problem in Egypt, a major environmental problem from a hygienic point of view, from an aesthetic point of view, and from a sustainable development point of view. So why am I saying this? I'm saying this because um, we are in 2020 now. We have the choice to say that if we turn a blind eye on the situation with respect to religious and ethnic minorities who are also economically excluded, we will see the impact of this not too far ahead. And this impact will affect us all. We are all interdependent and that impact will be on all of us. So I think what, we, what I'm trying to say is, um, in addition to this being a human rights issue, it's a question about saving our humanity for the future and saving our, our, our interdependence. Um, so I think on this point, let us hope that with the articles that we have shared with you, we end up with the, uh, the scenario of the article that had the rainbow, the one about social solidarity and cohesion and responding and ending hate speech and ending vilification now, um, so that we don't end up with the scenario that we saw in the second article um, about a great deal of division, a great deal of developmental hazards, as we saw uh, with uh, how the garbage collectors were dealt with in Egypt um, in um, 2009 when they were uh, unfairly blamed for um, the uh, pandemic. And on this note, I'd very much like to uh, pass the, the, the floor or, or, or give the floor to uh, Saeed Ali, uh, one of our partners um, working in Pakistan, who will uh, briefly share with us uh, how COVID-19 has affected religious inclusivity in Pakistan and what his organization as part of Creed is doing about it. Thank you very much again, um, um, uh, Mr. Ali, for joining us and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Just checking the final check. Okay, wonderful. So uh, the, thank you very much. As uh, Dr. Marie has kindly introduced, I am Ali from Pakistan. We have been working to counter extremism in the country for the last 15 years. Uh, we have worked in more than 40 cities and uh, my friends joining from Pakistan because I see a lot of familiar names. Uh, they might be knowing us for the Pakistan Youth Alliance, Hudi, uh, Dilse Pakistan and recently the hologram project that we are doing. So I would like to extend my thanks and gratitude to IDS and Creed uh, for organizing this very pertinent discussion. When poverty and religious inequalities intersect, they create a vicious cycle of uh, uh, marginalization, retarded economic growth, abuse, and hurdles towards true emancipation of the people. And added to this existential misery is how now the unprecedented way in which COVID-19 is unfolding. So minorities in Pakistan are a perfect example of this phenomenon in which the pandemic has disproportionately affected the state of intersectional marginalization that the communities were already suffering from. The pandemic has uh, not only exacerbated the uh, suffering but painted a very grim picture of when we talk about the future of religious inequalities in Pakistan. So uh, my discussion today is divided into three parts. First, I would like to shed some light on the unique circumstances that the minorities in Pakistan are going through and what unique struggles inform their day-to-day -day experiences uh, amidst the uh, COVID-19 outbreak. The f I think the major, the most important and critical component of this is the religious discrimination face of it. As the pandemic and the consequent lockdown started, Pakistan's very vibrant charity sector stepped in to provide immediate relief uh, to the masses. Um, however, several incidents of discrimination based on religion were observed, 
especially uh, with the Hindus and the Christian minorities in the country where, wherein aid was denied uh, to the affected because of their religious identity. And despite the pandemic, we have gotten reports of four to five cases of forced conversion of Hindu girls into Islam and in sin. Just a few weeks ago in Bahawalpur, a Hindu settlement was abruptly demolished. Uh, I talked to Hindus there and they believe it was, the, it was due to the political pressure of the religious right that enabled to do that. Another facet of this uh, religious discrimination is uh, how COVID-19 was labeled to be a Shia virus when it started spreading in Pakistan in March. A false binary highlighting Iran returned Shia pilgrims as the bringers of coronavirus in Pakistan was created. And uh, let me tell you, this, this was the trending topic on Pakistani Twitter for three days. We have also observed a recent case in which uh, uh, a COVID-19 recovered plasma was refused to be donated to a critical patient because it was uh, found that the patient is, belongs to the Shia sect. Um, now, if I talk about policy and legislation, a new resolution has been tabled in the parliament which makes it mandatory to use the uh, term the last prophet whenever the name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu is used. Of course, this is directly targeting the Ahmadi community because for them, the basic bone of contention uh, between their minority and majority status is this uh, very clause. So the, uh, the, it's being discussed right now and I think it will pass in the parliament in all of the houses. The second aspect of the intersectional marginalization that the minority communities are facing, especially due to the uh, 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 pandemic, is due to the increased economic hardships. As per our estimates, uh, 60 to 80 percent of Hindus and Christians uh, in informal settlements in Pakistan are daily wage workers. Many of them are without a legal contract. They do not have health insurance, etc. The COVID-19 has simply taken their source of income as as their in formal employment was abruptly terminated without a support package, without a due notice, etc. This has especially a minority, especially uh, uh, women belonging from the Christian uh, minority because they were working as domestic help in many urban centers. And many women who are working or employed in beauty parlors and salons have been impacted because uh, the, the businesses have been shut down. So their source of income is now greatly reduced. So um, when we talk about these challenges, I think it's impo also important to talk about how we can mount a, in, how we can mount an inclusive response to COVID-19. And uh, I, I believe the first step is uh, uh, the first hurdle in mounting that response is the lack of awareness. Uh, many people in Pakistan, even in the development sector or the policy circles, are un uh, the, the, the minorities in Pakistan are facing the intersectionality of issues and, and, and suffering essentially. And I think this, this sensitization is lacking, uh, broadly speaking. So unless we acknowledge this intersectionality and the problems that they face and try to solve them in a holistic manner, the elephant will always remain in the dark. Uh, another aspect of this lack of awareness is the conspiracy theories regarding COVID-19 spread. We were researching in, in some uh, Christian uh, informal settlements in Lahore, in some Hindu settlements in Karachi and in Islamabad, uh, with some Shia uh, populations, and we realized that conspiracy theories were very prevalent in, in these populations. And it's not, a very, it's not a minority issue per se, but generally speaking, it prevents them from living a very healthy life because it makes them more vulnerable to be infected uh, by the virus. I think another important issue when we talk about mounting an inclusive response is the lack of uh, capacity that NGOs and social workers right now have in dealing with the pandemic. Pakistan has a sizable development sector and uh, two very vibrant subsectors are the peace building sector and the education sector. And these, I'm talking about hundreds of NGOs, thousands of NGOs and hundreds of thousands that they have. But because of the lack of capacity to operate in a pandemic and the lack of trainings, uh, many of, much of the work has simply paused or I've seen many of the grants have been paused and the donors have said, pause this grant right now and we might carry on ne next year, in the year 2021. So what that has done is it, it has created a gap in, in mounting the inclusive response to uh, COVID-19. And this gap is being utilized by right-wing uh, parties and, and groups uh, which create a divisive narrative. So I think this is a huge uh, uh, um, hurdle. And, um, and to conclude, I would like to talk about the work that my organization Hive is doing, especially with the Al Khoi Foundation, our key partners in London, and also Creed and IDS. In London, uh, I would not lie to you, it was a shock for us 
we were in uncharted territory everything shut down and we didn't know what to do we are campaigners that love to be on the ground you know we don't like the digital <laughs> uh, sphere but thanks to our partners especially dr mariz mariam and yusuf alkhoi we were able to develop a very i, I would say comprehensive contingency plan on, on how to operate despite the hurdles that we were facing and how to navigate our way through this very uh, problematic situation so some this is the, some of the key work that we are doing uh, number one we, when we were researching on the ground we realized that most of our uh, minority collaborators or partners were not really interested in trainings and minority rights because they were looking for food on the table because the pandemic had had impacted their income and we started a volunteer effort a crowd source a crowd funded platform wherein we started adopting christian hindu and minority shia families who were deserving of some kind of aid so i am proud to tell you that due to this crowd funded effort we have been able to adopt more than 700 families from our target areas in in johanaba joseph colony 66 quarters rinchor lines and uh, jafar tayar in in karachi and this really embeds with the work that we are doing because once we provide them of course with some kind of relief do we uh, take the next step the next step is storytelling and advocacy we are about to launch a wonderful website that uh, uh, tells unique experiences and and stories of minority commu communities as they battle uh, the the pandemic and this is a public uh, uh, this is this will be for public information you will be witnessing stories from minority communities here on almost on a daily basis and the other part of this storytelling is the advocacy component we have partnered with some think tanks in pakistan and we will be producing a monthly situational report that will be furnished to the parliamentarians of pakistan to the human rights uh, committee in the senate and to other key stakeholders in the country because we want them to experience the unique challenges that minorities are facing and only when they are aware of that would they be able to inculcate a policy uh, that solve that tries to solve that problem another uh, uh, thing that we are doing is we call them community development projects we realized that some of the key developmental issues were aggravating the situation uh, of covid-19 and their minority status for example we realized in joseph colony lahore there was no water filtration plant and our christian friends and brothers and sisters had to walk 5 kilometers to get that water and that was making them vulnerable to be infected because they they couldn't be socially distant etc etc so we thought why not install a water filtration plant right in their community and then study how that improves their relationship with the muslim community and how that improves uh, some of the indicators that they are facing right now when it, when we talk about uh, marginalization so we are about to launch this project we are all, we have also conceived similar projects uh, with the minority communities uh, in in islamabad in, in interior sindh and in karachi and in other parts of pakistan the first project will be also So the, we, yeah, have to, we have to close off. I'm afraid now. It's. I think everyone can listen to you for hours to come. I think people would agree with with, with me on that because it's so exciting and it's so important. But perhaps we can feed this forward in the Q and A, and I'm Hello. sure there'll be a lot of questions on uh, regards to your work. Um, we uh, thank you so much uh, again. Um, so uh, without much ado, we. Uh, uh, the floor is yours, Hajja Fatma. Um, Hajja Fatma has also. um uh, is is recovering from covid-19 and uh we're just so delighted that despite um uh the 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 the, the state of convalescence that she has so very kindly uh joined us uh, hajja fatma floor is yours So we may be experiencing uh, some technical difficulties. Hajja Fatma is joining us from Nigeria. I just wonder whether maybe she's, she's on mute. Maybe she's on mute. Hajja Fatma, hello. It's uh, it, it's 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 so it's challenging because Hajja Fatma is also in a particular part of northern Nigeria where the 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 bandwidth isn't always uh, good. Perhaps hello, yes. hello. Can you hear me now? Oh, Thank wonderful. You. Wonderful. Please go ahead. I can hear you clearly. Um my name is Fatima Suleiman from Nigeria. I want to thank Creed for having me in this important discussion today. Um I had the Islamic Council Initiative of Nigeria ISIN, which is an interfaith uh
organization established since 20. for religious equality and inclusive development. I'm currently doing a paper uh, with Creed on a research writing on sharing experiences of members of religious excluded groups intersecting inequalities in the of COVID-19 has been very challenging, just like uh, Professor Marie said. Uh, Khaja Fatma, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. It seems there's some uh, technical adventures happening at the moment. Shell, do you mind if you can very kindly close your video and you will still have our full attention as we listen to you? Okay. So just like I said, I, uh, I'm doing, currently doing a research paper for Creed, sharing the experiences of members of religious excluded groups intersecting inequalities in everyday life, which has been very, uh, um, very good, uh, trying to understand uh, uh, the role of minority women within communities. Um, I, within the COVID-19 period, we have had um, a lot of death rates on COVID-19. I lost a, a loved one trying to take care of him. And trying to recover from the pandemic, I realized that women are more marginalized within this pandemic. Um, uh, after my recovery, I couldn't tell most of my friends and I had a hard time with my family. The only people who encouraged me were my mother and my children. Within the period, I realized that women are more marginalized within isolate, isolation centers being um, a myth within Northern Nigeria. Many people saw it as an elite virus. Within this same period, many women are more marginalized within the center due to poor health uh, conditions, poor hygiene, not suitable for women, Women are given less attention than men in isolation centers. There, there are even fewer women uh, medical uh, personnel within the isolation centers and few equipments for testing to take care of patients within uh, the isolation centers. And there are highly inadequate medical supply to cater for uh, the high population within the center. Uh, there was a lot of depression uh, though there are very few psychologists to encourage and inspire uh, patients. Uh, but after my recovery, I started short messages on COVID-19 prevention on social media and distribution of palliatives through my organization I work for by supporting also victims who recovered and also marginalized women to prevent the spread of the virus. Uh, the impact of COVID-19 on women is very huge, especially economically within the northern part of Nigeria. Because we all, we all know that within Nigeria, especially within uh, the northern part of Nigeria, there is high rate of uh, illiterate, uh, uneducated uh, people. So most of the women and men earn less than a dollar a day. So the economic situation dropped. There was shortage of food as farmers could not go to the farm due to lack of uh, the lockdown order to stay at home including increase in prices of food items and medical supplies. There were even high rate of crime, kidnap and drug sales, intake of uh, drugs by even women themselves. The impact of the pandemic has been difficult, particularly for women who are poor and uneducated and are highly marginalized, forming about 60% of our region. During the pandemic, there has been an increase in incidences of sexual and domestic violence, Rape cases were frequent. Every week, six out of 10 minors and girls were raped, ranging from three months to 29 years old women. Women were beaten up by their spouses during the lockdown, lockdown order by the government. And then policies on protection of the victims of rape are still not in place through, though there have been efforts by CSOs, NGOs, and women activists groups to be able to um, um, call for action on issues of domestic violence. 
groups have made several protests, even on social media, but the, the, the implementation by the government is still slow. In my, in, in my own experience, religion makes little difference from what I've experienced and worked on. But the key focus for addressing poverty and marginalization in Northern Nigeria should be on education, educating the populace, especially the women, so that we can have more health practitioners that are women. And then we can also encourage uh, target minority group on climate change opportunities Water, sanitation, and hygiene has been a big issue in northern Nigeria. The shortage of water supply, I think uh, water, sanitation, hygiene initiatives should be encouraged. And empowerment for women across boards should also be encouraged for inclusion into governance to be able to make a difference. More women in health sectors should be encouraged to have better hospitals with standard equipment to handle people with other illnesses like asthma, HIV and AIDS, high blood pressure and diabetes. During the COVID-19, there has been immense um, uh, human rights violations, especially from the security, which are supposed to protect life and uh, women, men within the society. So there is still a lot to be done within Northern Nigeria, especially within the IDP groups which are challenged and I think um, the, the government needs to stand on its feet on rejigging the system, on our health system, on our education and even encouraging the farmers because Nigeria is an agrarian society. The North is suffering from terrorism, issues of high youth unemployment, women marginalization. So I think a lot should be done in trying to cope uh, uh, revamp the system to be able to have a, a good post-COVID uh, uh, transition. Because if our, our system is not re revamped, I think uh, uh, the marginalized group don't stand a chance for development and growth. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Hajja Fatma. I think this is a the, the way you are describing the situation on the ground so powerfully reminds us that um, we, without addressing poverty and security, uh, there can be no inclusive policy. Without uh, having a, a policy that is sensitive to uh, marginalized women, um, whatever we do will always be seriously compromised, especially when they are suffering from very gender specific forms of um um targeting and 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 uh, i mean it's it's not because of covid that they are uh, vulnerable to gender based violence but it is uh, because of their vulnerability prior to covid which has now been exacerbated by covid that we see uh, this situation escalating um to such extreme cases uh, with such high frequency of uh, gender-based violence. Thank you so much for reminding us of the way in which inequalities are so interconnected and we need a pro-women, we know we need security, we need a pro-poor policy uh, for, for, for us to talk about inclusivity. Um, we, um, please, if you have any questions for uh, Hajja Fatma or Saeed Ali or uh, for Mr. Salam, who is about to speak now, uh, please start typing in um, and we will collate these questions. And of course, uh, questions from Mr. Shishti. We will start uh, collating all of these questions and passing it on to them. So without much ado, Mr. Salam, the, the floor is yours. Hajra Fatma, may I ask you to very kindly um, uh, mute the mic? Thank you so much.
Mr. Salam, it, it seems that there's a problem with the, um, with the voice. Um, I'm afraid um, we can't hear you, uh, Mr. Salam. Um, do you want to... now, now can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. Okay, good. I Sorry. I can hear you. Okay, I should repeat it. So, my name is Salam Omar. I'm from Iraq. So I'm a journalist and I'm uh, the editor-in-chief of a media organization called Kirkuk Now. So uh, we are operating, publishing news in Iraq's disputed territories. Iraq's disputed territories are territories between the federal government in Baghdad and the Kurdish government in the north. So according to Iraqi constitutions, these areas should be solved their, their future should be solved according to the Iraqi constitution. So we basically do in-depth journalism in those areas in the local languages like Arabic, Kurdish and Turkmen, including English. So we have been partner recently with Coalition for Religious uh, Equality and Inclusive Development. Uh, we have been reporting about uh, the, the impact of COVID-19 on the min minorities in those areas. Why these areas are important? Because they are usually unsafe and most of the Iraqi minorities live there, such as Christians, Yazidis, Shabak, and Kakais and, and Baha'is. So uh, with this, so Kirkuk now is, is, our mission is to inform and engage with those communities with the support of in, in, uh, prestigious media and or, uh, international organizations. Uh, here, I would like to talk about one of those minorities which has uh, been through a lot of hardship over the past uh, like three years and also recently since March with the spread of COVID-19. I'm talking about Kakais. Kakais are a, 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 a minority with around 100,000 uh, people, uh, li mostly living in Kirkuk, north of Baghdad, in, in, in provinces like Nainawa in the north and Halabja, closer to Iran. And so. This, this minority has, has been through a lot of uh, problems uh, over the past like three months. Uh, what, what should I say about this minority? They are actually, they are not, actually they have lost a lot of ground because of the Islamic State uh, advancing to those areas and also because of the uncertainties happened after the Kurdish referen referendum in those areas and now recently with the COVID-19. Uh, they, this minority has been subject to also a lot of stereotypes because of the, their appearances and also because they are a small minority, so they have been subject to a lot of injustice in the country. What happened to this minority throughout the COVID-19 is actually one of the very, very big challenges is actually security challenges. So over the past like two months, they, there has been a, around 15 insurgent attacks on this minority south of Kirkuk. What, why this happened? Because uh, like uh, insurgent groups like uh, Al uh, ISIS and also other insurgent groups are very active in those areas and they purposely attack these minorities, especially the Kakai minority. Why the Iraqi government and other forces don't respond because they are actually very busy with the, lo with the complete lockdown in the country. So this is, has been a, a huge uh, uh, challenge for this minority. So there has been a lot of like uh, violence and so, and we have, as a result of this, we have like over, we have around 15 villages south of the city in, 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 of Kirkuk. And then five of them have been evacuated. And then a lot of people actually left the area. This is when it comes to security challenges. That is one of the big problems that it, it, we are afraid like if we continue like that, so we are going to lose this minority in those areas. And with the loss of this minority, we lose a lot. Like another implication is the economic imp implication of this because they are very hard workers. They, they work on farmers and also they are very talented and uh, uh, they have got a lot of uh, handmade jobs. So they are brilliant in talent. So, uh, so we, we, are, we, are, we are afraid that we are going to lose them. We have, we have been reporting about this. For example, we have such as pot poetry. Poetry is one of their like all time businesses. So we have like people who have lost one century business in those areas. So they, uh, they have been left with nothing, nothing. We have other stories about, for example, we have farmers who have lost uh, around 30,000, 40,000 US dollars over the past two months because they couldn't go onto their farms, because, because they couldn't actually plant because of the security concerns. So these huge changes over this small minority, so with a, with a lot of politics happening in Baghdad and there is no a lot of focus on them, it has been a, a, a tragedy. Uh, what's now it, it doing is there has been other 
other implications, like there has been also positive implications. For example, the newly appointed prime minister visited Kirkuk and was talking about what happened to this uh, small minority. And the president had a few meetings uh, uh, like three days ago, but it seems like it's, it's continuing like that. For example, two hours before this, uh, this seminar, one of the female Kakai journalists phoned me and said, you have to do this presentation very well because the situation is so bad, it's doing there. Right now she is busy with, like for example, two families, three families to, with the help of others to be relocated in the north. So I think the situation is, 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 is not, is actually not very positive. What should be done right now, it's media focus is really, really important. Thank you so much for the, for Creed, for the support and we have been doing a lot of reporting and sending out and and it was picked up by other international and local and international organizations. Actually, this minority asked for a joint force. They need the Kurdish government in the north and Baghdad, they get united and protect them. So if they, don't, they are not protected, we're afraid that we are going to lose this community. Other, other steps to be taken is actually they need more representation in Baghdad. Actually, they don't have any representation in the Iraqi parliament, in the governments, so in, in local administration, so this should be done a lot. Another issue is like if the pressure is needed actually from both in nationally and internationally on those issues. On those, uh, so to deal with this, uh, with uh, this issue, this is actually general. It applies to Christians in Nineveh. It applies to other minorities such as Shabab, because they, they most of them are they like they are IDPs living in the camps. They left their jobs, and also we have like a few thousands of Christians living in a wide area, and they have one general practitioner. They haven't received any actually any support. So with the Kakai are in danger. So there should be. Uh, more to be done to protect them, like both uh, locally and internationally. So thank you so much for listening to me. If there are any other questions, I would be able to answer uh, in the discussions. Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. I think a very important point. I think you keep on repeating, we will lose them. I think you're referring to an existential crisis here. We are talking about uh, a, a community that numerically has shrunk so dramatically um, that we are talking about if they lose their land, if they lose their uh, whatever remains of the heritage of the community, um, we are faced with one of the oldest communities in the Middle East uh, um, being ex I mean, we, we would we would be deprived of what they have uh, contributed to Iraq and the Middle East. So we'll come back to this question because I think we have received a question regarding what, why are they existentially in threat? And perhaps in the Q&A you may come and revisit that question. Um, but again, we are talking about interconnected issues. We're talking about we cannot do development in a security vacuum. We need there to be rule of law. We need there to be accountability on the ground. We need there to be safety for farmers to work on the land, um, for us to be able to mitigate the um, extreme um, impact of, uh, of uh, uh, destabilization and inequality and exclusion that COVID is further contributing to. So thank you, Mr. Salam, for raising this. And also thank you for talking about representation. People need to have a voice need to be sitting at the table and need to be able to um, uh, 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 represent their agenda and their issues themselves. Um, all issues about what if we don't engage with this now and as you said uh, this needs uh, a great deal of international spotlight um, so that there can be pressure on accountability. To tell everyone that the wonderful work of Kirkuk now um, which has been uh, greatly supported uh, via, uh, via Creed, via Minority Rights Group, um, is available on the Creed uh, webpage. Um, if anyone wants to read the very important news stories that are coming out via Kirkuk now, in addition to their own website. Um, so I think this is, this is, we're talking here about a lot of recurring patterns, a lot of issues showing intercon interconnectedness. There is no magic wand, there is no magic bullet. We need to deal with issues of poverty, issues of representation, issues of gender, issues of uh, pre-existing inequalities, issues of safety and security, uh, whether we're talking about Egypt or Pakistan or Nigeria or Iraq, even if the contexts are very different. I um, just wanted to uh, 
stop here and pass on to Mike Badcock, who is the civil society team leader uh, for inclusive societies um, at uh, DFID, who brings 30 years of uh, experience and expertise in supporting um, international and local organizations, accompanying them in what does inclusive policy look like. Um, do please continue to send questions for our participants, for Mr. Shishti and for our participants and also for Mike as he um, 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 gives us some of his thoughts uh, before we open for Q&A. Uh, &A. Thank you. And Mike, over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm Mike Backcock. I work at Department for International Development. I lead on our work on freedom of religion or belief. The, this afternoon's seminar on how we can address religious inequalities in a post-COVID-19 world is so important. Religious minorities are already facing discrimination, marginalization, and violence. COVID-19 um, and the efforts to contain COVID-19 are just increasing these pre-existing uh, problems and inequalities. So what can be done? And it has been so excellent this afternoon to hear from you about the key challenges that religious minor minorities are facing and uh, the suggestions, the ideas on what needs to be done to tackle these problems. So the challenges, you've, you've highlighted, sadly, you've highlighted many, many challenges that you are facing. Fake news, conspiracy theories, scapegoating of religious minorities, the development of online campaigns, hate speech, leading to discrimination, violence, the security issues, also the domestic violence issues and economic hardship. Um, just to talk about some of these hate speech and online campaigns, the COVID-19 crisis has stoked fear, as various speakers mentioned, has spoke has stoked hysteria. This has led to discrimination and intolerance in many countries. Saeed Ali mentions the blaming, the scapegoating of the Shia community in Pakistan. And there were many other examples that people have provided. Exclusion and discrimination. The impact of COVID-19 will disproportionately impact the most vulnerable. Religious minorities are already living in harsh conditions. COVID-19 is just going to make this situation worse. Saeed Ali provided examples of the denial of aid, dis dis distinct discrimination, the denial of aid to religious minorities. Um, and this is all leading to economic hardship. As I said, the impact is going to be on the most vulnerable and religious minorities are often the most vulnerable. Um, and there were many examples provided of religious minorities being daily workers or domestic workers and employment has ended with no safety nets. S uh, Salam Omar mentioned the impact in Iraq and the colossal impact in respect to farming and small businesses. And finally, there is the uh, real challenge of violence, the security in many countries. Minorities are facing violence in so many countries. Fatima Suleiman highlighted the increase in domestic violence, um, which is a serious problem in many countries. So a lot of challenges to tackle. What needs to be done, what has to be done. And it was so good to be able to hear all the ideas and the suggestions and on the identification of what actually needs to be done to tackle these challenges. Um, understanding, evidence and knowledge. There is a real need to understand the situation, to have evidence and have knowledge on how to tackle the problems. Um, Saeed Ali highlighted the real need, oh, and Mariz did as well, of a better understanding of the intersectionality between religious minorities and the other factors that are affecting uh, society. There is a real need for the provision of reliable information, 
to tackle fake news, to tackle conspiracies, to tackle inaccurate and dangerous information. Um, there was the suggestion for more interfaith community development action. And this can be on sanitation, health, education, various examples were provided. And as Fatima Suleiman mentioned, the need for more empowerment of women to tackle these problems. This leads on to the next issue is building the capacity or maintaining the capacity, sadly, um, of the development organizations, of the organizations that are carrying out this work. Uh, there, there is a need for more training and for basic resources for these organizations to be able to carry on providing support to the various different religious minority communities and to tackling the, uh, the issues. Um, there is the need for more representation of religious minorities. Again, Salam Omar mentioned that. Um, finally, there is the, the issues that Raymond Christie, uh, the Prime Minister's Special Envoy, highlighted of getting aid to the grassroots organisations that can support religious minorities. And the, the other issue that he highlighted, the need for improving the accountability for those that abuse human rights tackling those sort of issues to uh, address the long-term impact of violence. So this was extremely useful for me. I'm very interested in the um, questions and answers. And what I'm always really interested to hear is what should we be doing differently in the future? What should I be telling people across DFID to do to tackle these issues? That's the key thing, action, practical action. Great, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Mike. We have a number of questions. I think there are two questions for Mr. Shishti. The first question has to do with how will the merger of DFID um, and the FCO impact uh, the support for the development sector, particularly uh, the development sector that is supporting freedom of religion or belief in developing countries? The question comes from, um, uh, Bonnie Evans Hills um, and there's another question very much related which is um, how uh, with regard to developmental aid to faith-based organizations many of these are very small actors on the ground how uh, how is it planned to link these small um, organizations to UK uh, delivery aid we Mr. Shishti would you like to answer these questions and then we can pose that we can share the questions um, for the other participants because I think these are very specific to you. Yeah, Marie, thank you um, very, very much. And, um, and thank you to Reverend Bonnie for that uh, very question. Um, with regards to specifics on the merger of uh, DFID and the Foreign Office and how that will impact on the work of promoting four, if I give you a specific example as to why I think it's a very good idea to have those two departments come together, specifically looking at it from a four uh, perspective. The, the report I have in front of me is the Truro Report uh, by Bishop Philip, which looks at uh, the Foreign Office's approach uh, to championing four across government at an international level. If we look at the different uh, the recommendations on this report, um, for example, recommendation four, gather reliable information and data on four to better inform the developmental policy for the United Kingdom. Recommendation five, blossom the research into critical intersection of form and minority rights with wider human rights issues, economic security regarding religious minorities, covers DFID and the foreign policy coming together. Recommendation 21 um, of the uh, report, um, humanitarian agencies and no adverse discrimination. And next to it, I previously had discussions with uh, a previous minister who covered um, DFID uh, aid, um, Baroness Liz Sugg, um, on commissioning DFID work to look at challenges people from religious minorities may face when trying to access aid to determine uh, any lessons which may be learned. So in answering your question, looking at this specific report I have, there is so much interlinking uh, between promoting four for the United Kingdom across the board internationally and the work that we do um, on DFID and aid. So I think having departments, uh, you know, coming together into one, 
strategically is, in my view, looking at delivering this agenda for the government, for the Prime Minister, I think is absolutely crucial. And I think the Foreign Affairs Select Committee also uh, said uh, having the two departments work together uh, is, is, is a very good idea, and many countries around the world already do it. But from a forward perspective, I think it's absolutely crucial looking at what I take forward in a true report. There is so much overlap in promoting forward and developmental, which I think it's a very, very uh, important to have them uh, aligned moving forward with that departmental restructuring. The second point about aid uh, to faith organisations on the ground. Can I again reiterate, there was a brilliant document, um, from the, uh, uh, if we can share it, um, from the um, Wilton Park Conference in 2008, um, Humanitarian uh, a, uh, Development and Aid Supporting Fall, um, and that was in 2018. The report I take forward again for Bishop Philip, um, I think covers that specific point. How can we get aid uh, supporting faith-based organisations on the ground who may be able to reach areas which governments may not? And I think those are the conversations that are taking place and those are the representations I've made uh, to ministers. That comes back to the first point. You know, um, you need DFID and Foreign Office coming all together because the conversation I have is, oh yes, that's a DFID point, that's a Foreign Office point. But having them two aligned together would mean that you can best able to uh, get the strategies uh, working in one, but those conversations have been made. And I think from NGOs to me and me to government ministers to say, how can we move forward in delivering the Truro Report, which uh, puts forward the point about supporting faith-based organisations. And I make this point, faith-based organisations comes back to faith-based organisations across the board of all faiths and none, because for us in the UK, it's for, for all. So those are the conversations that are taking place. And I think I've made representation to ministers and the government to look at how best we can take that forward. Oh, apologies. I did mute myself. Apologies. Thank you very much, Mr. Sheshti, for this very comprehensive reply. Much appreciated. Um, we have uh, two questions. One is um, for the panelists, and it is asking, um, what do you want the uh, international organizations or people who are based in the UK to do to... Um, to amplify the situation in terms of awareness needs. What is it that you want people here to know about the situation? What can help um, from the work that you're doing um, on the ground in terms of what are the messages and what are the key issues that you want them um, to know about here? And then there's another question, which I'm just opening, um, which is how can international bodies hold governments accountable for their role and even leadership in proliferating religious stigmatization. Um, so again, a very similar role about people who are positioned here, what can they do? Um, so that is for all members of the, 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 the panel. Then there is one specific question for uh, Mr. Salam, which is, what do you mean that we will lose them? And uh, this question is asking, um, do you mean genocidal elimination? So they're asking, you, do you feel that the Kakais are experiencing or potentially going to experience genocidal implications? So let's start with the question that is for all members of the panel, um, which has to do with um, what do you want people here to do in terms of amplifying the voices? Um, and the second is more specific to Mr. Salam. And then I'm sorry, there's just one more question on Iraq which is what is being done in Iraq to recognize the identity of Yazidi women's children born out of IS rape? So two questions for Mr. Salam um, and one question for uh, everyone. Um, let's start with a generic question for everyone. And I'm going to ask you to very graciously keep your answers as um, brief as possible so that we can also move on to the other questions that are arriving as we speak. So I think uh, we will do this in the order of those uh, of, of people who have spoken. So Mr. Uh, Mr. Saeed Ali, can you please go first, followed by Hajja Fatma, followed by Mr. Salam. And as you answer that generic question, Mr. Salam, perhaps you can answer specific questions with uh, Iraq. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. I, I mean, 
Uh, I do not represent an international humanitarian organization or an INGO or a donor organization. So I will only mention about what I think could be done. If some organization on the ground is discriminating on the on the basis of religion, it, it should be immediately reported to their parent organization that, like it is men mentioned in this particular uh, context. I'm not aware of the particular context, but there's a very transparent uh, reporting policy. Uh, if it's one of the big uh, donors like DFID and USAID and whatever, I mean, immediate uh, reporting should be done and such people who are discriminating on the basis of uh, their response to this uh, unprecedented uh, uh, tragedy that the humankind is facing right now, they should be, I think, punished and should be reported immediately. Um, the second question is from uh, Varma. Uh, and it is again on the same lines, how can international bodies hold governments accountable? Yeah, this is very important because in many cases we see the state being complicit in, in, in trying to aggravate the situation of uh, you know, minority persecution, like I mentioned in Pakistan. Now all of a sudden during the COVID time, a new bill has been tabled which discriminates very clearly, which is targeted against the Ahmadi, which are the uh, persecuted minority. So I think, I mean, more active role from the UN, more active role from international HR agencies, uh, Amnesty International, and MPs of other governments. Uh, they need to pressurize these local governments that are doing these uh, things and immediate action should be taken because if I, I fear the action is not taken, the, the, the condition of religious inequality will worsen. And after the pandemic, we will have a more polarized world. We will have more hate speech. We will have more conflicts and more extremisms. So I guess that's it. Thank you very much. Hajja Fatma, uh, what do you want to see uh, people who are based in the UK and internationally do uh, better um, in order to uh, bring to um, the fore the, situ the situation uh, um, in Nigeria and what kind of accountability mechanisms uh, would help? I think in my own opinion, I think uh, minority groups should be supported in the area of education to cope COVID-19. Because the sensitization is still very low, considering so many languages on in Nigeria, I think also CFD so capacity should be enriched how get citizens to be locked down. So I think there's need for CSOs and NGOs to be supported to be able to uh, report human. And, uh, how can international bodies hold government accountable? Well, I think through the Human Rights uh, Commission, I think. Action should be taken on issues of sexual violations and security issues that has to do with citizens. I think those are very important. Very much, Hajj Fatma. Um, really appreciate this. You're reminding us again um, that uh, agreed measures such as holding perpetrators of sexual violence to account, even though uh, this was agreed a long time ago, 1325 resolution and others, uh, we are still not seeing this institutionalized in terms of accountability pathways. Um, this is a, a really important area. Um, sorry, did I interrupt you? Sorry, did I interrupt you? No, not at all. Great. Well, much appreciated. Um, so we, we uh, move to, on to Mr. Salam, um, the generic questions and the more specific questions uh, with respect to Iraq. Uh, in terms of support, I think there are three points it's important for me, like uh, pressure at the political level because it's, it's immediate threat. So and the, at, the local at the local level, it's actually how we support the families and actually stop this. So this is one, and also continuing with the exposure, media exposure, and more reliable information and quality reporting about this, because in the in the order of, of importance in the Iraqi uh, media, minorities are not so important. So uh, this is also, I think, these are 
three things that are really, really important to me. What, in terms of why, I, I literally mean we are losing them. Because this is not the first time. We have been very naive from the beginning, after, before 15 years, when we had over 1 million Iraqi Christians, and now we have around 300,000. So we were act, actually, they were, uh, they were displaced, left the country, and also did, did lose all their properties. And then when the ISIS came, the Islamic State, we were so naive, couldn't protect the Yazidis. And then we have lost half of the population, and then they're all living in camps. Now I'm, I'm afraid in, in a few weeks' time, in, in, three, in two months, that we are losing this, this minority again. So literally losing them, it, it's, it's like that, because this is not what's happening. This is not the first time that's happening to a minority in Iraq. In, in terms of identity, uh, about, for example, for the Yazidis, for the Kakais, for others, it, it's a very complicated issue. Actually, before the, uh, the, the social protests in October, last October, there were efforts in the parliament to deal with this issue. It's a very complicated issue because, like, I'm an Iraqi, I actually, I'm really ashamed of like having a, a fellow citizen couldn't have the freedom to to say I'm like I'm 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 Kakai I'm Ezidi. So he's he's been forced to be registered as a Muslim, and this is actually a very very you know big problem, and it's happening. It it has become a very huge problem with the after ISIS also uh, you know came, and also we have a lot of children from the ISIS fathers. So, and then according to the Iraqi law, you can have, you have to have your uh, father known until to be registered. So that's why we have a campaign now here called, my name is my mother's name. So we need, so whoever his mother is there should be registered in her mother's religion or name. And that's, it, it actually benefits a lot of Ezidis, Kakais and other minorities. This is a huge problem and it is a lot of, pres a lot of pressure and, and efforts. Thank you very much, Mr. Salam, uh, for this uh, very helpful uh, reply. We also have a question for you, Mr. Shishti, um, which is about the Magnitsky Act uh, and whether there's a timeline for passing it in the UK. Um, I don't know whether you would like to respond to that. Yeah, well, the government's made it very clear um, as part of the, uh, uh, the uh, legislation that was passed about two years ago, and it was supported by all parliamentarians from across parliament to say the United Kingdom government should have a Nixon style human rights uh, global sanctions uh, independent scheme. Um, and so the government is in the process now, the foreign sector is in the process now of uh, looking to take that forward. I can't comment on specific designations on that. That is a matter which the uh, foreign secretary uh, will have to make a decision on. But the United Kingdom government is very clear. We are very much um, you know, uh, committed to taking that forward. So I would say um, we need to just wait for that legislation to come through, but the government is very, very much committed to taking it forward. And the same thing with the Truro Report, recommendation seven, uh, eight, sorry, is be prepared to impose sanctions against perpetrators of four abuses. So I would say uh, the government's commitment, it's accepted that recommendation on the wider uh, Magnitsky style human rights uh, sanctions. I would say just watch the space with regards to specific designations. The government's very committed to it and we'll see that uh, legislation come through uh, you know, in the not so distant future. Thank you so much, Mr. Shishti. Much appreciated. We have one question that has come to Hajja Fatma. This is from Rebecca, and she's saying, during the lockdown in some states in Nigeria, a lot of communities were attacked and many were killed. Um, do you, uh, don't you think they were attacked because of religion? So she's asking Hajja Fatma, was their targeted associated with their religious affiliation? Hajja Fatma just wondered whether uh, you, you are here with us. I know the bandwidth is not always helpful. Okay, well, I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll allow Hajja Fatma to, to reply to that question either via the chat function or perhaps later. I think we want to go back to, uh, to Mike's question. 
in terms of, we know these problems are complex and um, there is no magic wand. Uh, but I think perhaps if, if we talk about um, what do we urgently need to do right now, collectively, um, so that uh, the, 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 those intersections of inequality that are causing so much um, dispossession and so much um, hardship. What, what can um, DFID do better in terms of alignment of policy and practice um, to be able to be more responsive? I think perhaps if people can kindly share in, um, in that group chat, we will certainly make sure that we, uh, uh, we we can we convey to uh, DFID. We share. Um, just wondered whether there are any other final questions. So we still ha I have the group chat open and just wondered for the last ten minutes uh, whether there are any final questions. Unless Hajja Fatma um, has uh, has been able to resume um, connection. Okay, well, we are almost at the end. I think it is very brave of everyone to have uh, stayed so late on a Friday afternoon, but the issue is urgent and the issue is di dire. Just want to say that um, as a Creed program, uh, we are just waiting for sign off from um, the government, but we, have, uh, we are going to, once we have a sign off, we will be announcing this. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, 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 a grant making mechanism that will involve the uh, extension of small uh, seed money to small NGOs. Um, if, if an international NGO is based in the UK and is working locally, they can certainly apply, but we would hope that you would be able to um, um, forward a lot of this money or, 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 or take it forward with the to the local organization. And the idea is that with this small money, uh, will also come public health uh, expertise. Uh, we have a lot of people who work on epidemiology and public health in IDS, and the idea is that they will be there on call to support you. For example, in Pakistan, um, we talked about when we're extending water services, um, we cannot do it in a way where people open taps because through the opening of the taps with their hands, there can be a risk of um, a risk of uh, uh, the transmission of the virus. So uh, our colleagues here in IDS, uh, through the support with the HOI and uh, in engagement with uh, Hive, uh, talked to the local partners in those communities about creating a footstep uh, so people can use the foot pedal in order to have access to water rather than using their hand. So we really hope that um, once this is made available, we could share it with everyone. And it is small, but we hope that it will provide, in addition to the seed money, it will provide public health support and will also provide support in how local communities can, can um, document their work on the ground in a way that doesn't burden them with too much uh, research protocol. It will be very much uh, uh, geared to development practitioners and faith actors being able to document their work in ways that are easy and practical. Um, so we hope to be able to share this with you as soon as we have the approval um, and um, we can then be able to also convey uh, what is uh, happening on the ground through these initiatives that we hope we would have the, the privileges creed of partnering with you on in order to take it forward. This will be with the idea of working with poor people uh, who are experiencing uh, acute inequality on account of their faith or no faith. Uh, so those that are experiencing inequalities in access and resources in awareness because they have no faith would also be able to apply. We have one final question coming in uh, from Megan Rowland in Tier Fund. Again, it's to, to you, Mr. Shishti, I think, or it's to, um, to uh, yes, I think it's to, to you, Mr. Shishti, and it says as follows, I'm just reading it out. Um, ID, uh, DFID in the UK government should influence the UN on how, sorry, I'm just reading it and it's uh, slippery. It's um, just re strolling down, apologies about this. So it's not a question. Uh, uh, Megan has just said it's a comment. So I think anybody who wants to uh, comment on it, I think uh, we have a few minutes. 
two or three minutes. Um, dear Friday, the UK government should influence the UN on how it engages FBOs and faith leaders by urging UN agencies to ensure the consultation involvement of local actors, including faith-based actors in the amendment of the UN HRPS in each country. Also UN OCHA to out outline um, how, to, uh, how they plan to improve access to country-based pooled funds for local and national uh, actors and ensure that the UN Central Emergency Respond Fund and UN CBF, uh, CBPFS facilitate and strengthen the work of local responders, including local NGOs and non-NGO partners like faith leaders. DFID should also track the timelines quantity and quality of UK aid that is channeled through UN agencies to ensure it reaches local NGOs, including local faith-based actors and promotes local uh, leadership. Um, and um, I think this is, uh, Megan is sharing that this is also um, in relation to Mike's question about what can DFID do in order to make policies more inclusive. So I don't know whether uh, anyone wants to comment on this. Uh, it's it's a it's a. Bruce, can I just say, um, with regards to the specifics and the depth of that question, first, can I just say uh, a big thank you to Megan and Tearfund for all the uh, wonderful work that they do on the specifics of this question. Um, if um, Megan or if Maurice yourself post this, can send that to me, um, and then I can ask officials. Uh, to look at that point that's been raised specifically and come back. So I think to do it justice, the, question, the way the question has been put, if I can, um, if yourself or if Megan to the fund can send me an email on that, I can ask um, the team to look at that matter and come back to you, um, uh, or to come back to Megan and yourselves on that. If we can do that, I'm, I'm more than happy to take that away and get that looked at once I get the email. Wonderful. Thank you so, so much. Much appreciated. Uh, I think it is 5.27. Uh, it's uh, time, I think, to, uh, um, if, if, if there are conversations, if there are more questions, uh, we can perhaps have another event in future. But on this occasion, I would like to convey my heartiest thank you to Mr. Shishti for joining us, for so kindly and graciously reshuffling your earlier schedule in order to be with us right from the beginning and throughout. Really appreciate you being with us. Um, also to our panelists who have so graciously, I mean, I think uh, as, um, as, uh, as everyone mentioned, this is a, this is a context uh, with lockdown and uh, internet difficulties. So appreciate um, Saeed Ali uh, from Pakistan, Haja Fatma who's joined us from Nigeria, Mr. Salam who's joined us from Iraq, and Mike Batcock who's joined us from DFID. Um, very, very quickly in these last two minutes, um, Emily from IDS is reminding us that there's a very quick survey. Um, it helps us improve our work. It helps us be accountable to you. Um, so if everyone can very quickly um, fit it in, it should not take, I've been promised, not take more than uh, two minutes. Thank you for our participants. Thank you for everyone who has joined us from all four corners um, to engage and discuss um, this very critical issue. And um, we hope to see you on future events, which we hope to have one fairly soon. We'll share with everyone. And please, please, please take, um, take uh, 120 seconds to fill in that survey. Um, on behalf of Creed, on behalf of El uh, Khoi, on behalf of MRG, on behalf of uh, the Ecopic Office for Advocacy and Public Policy and IDS, um, I want to say a hearty thank you until we meet again. <laughs>